Good morning. And welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent and this first Sunday of December. We were just talking about we can't believe that it's already December. Um, just a reminder that your angel tree gifts are due today. And if you did not remember to bring them um, or need to find another time, they have to be at, with Elizabeth by Tuesday. So please contact Elizabeth Gibson um, to let her to make arrangements for getting your angel tree gifts to her before Tuesday. Also in your bulletin today, you should see that we have an insert about our poinsettias and the Church World Service blanket. So if you would like to do either a poinsettia or a blanket in honor or a memory of anyone, uh, please fill out this form and uh, give turn this in to Ken. And also this week we have the Circle Number 3 Christmas Gathering Fellowship at Tuesday at 6 o'clock. So we're already starting some of our, our Advent and Christmas activities and um, any of you that would like to join us for any of those are welcome. Let us worship God. our Advent lectionary scriptures, let us be called into worship. In this season of prophecy, promise, and preparation, we come to be renewed and refreshed. We 
We come to listen for words of hope and joy, promise and challenge. We come with open ears, open minds, open hearts. We come to receive the blessings God has in store for us in this season of waiting. Come, let us worship the our God, the one who brings all things to fulfillment. Let us pray. God of hope and encouragement, we come in the midst of this season of busyness and preparation. We come here to find a time and a space to slow down, to reflect on what our true preparations should be, to rest in your presence, and to prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits to worship you today. Amen. You may be seated. we lit a candle of hope. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light a candle for peace. The prophets promised that the coming Messiah would bring the presence and peace of God. The prophet Isaiah foretells of his peace of the Christ in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The candle of peace is kindled. O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind, bid envy, strife, and quarrels cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. Amen.
Baptizer cries, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Let us confess our sins this Advent to prepare for the coming of Christ. Join me now in our confession of sin. God of the prophets, we confess our lack of preparedness and our tendency to wander away from you and your path. You call us to venture outside our comfortable spaces, yet we hunker down and excuse ourselves from faithful actions. Lord, forgive us. Call out to us again from the wilderness. Help us to respond this Advent in faith. Amen. With great mercy, God forgives what we have confessed and offers us new life in Christ. Receive the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and be at peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. And now remaining right where you are, let us share the peace of Christ with one another by waving to your friends and neighbors here and at home. The peace of Christ be with you all. You may be seated while Lacey, Emma, and our children collect our Russell bags of food for the hungry and our coins for heifer. Debbie has quarters. Oh. Judson. Judson. You got more. Here. Can you get the ones right there? Judson, look behind you. Look behind you. Will it be child time? Yes, there will be child time. Okay, can you go to the front? Mm -hmm. There's only two kids today. Mm -hmm. You're funny. Oh, that is funny, Preston. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sit right there, Justin. Okay, guys, I brought something super cool today. Do y'all know what this is? It is a flashlight. What do, what do we use a flashlight for? What am I, I use dark. this for? In the dark, right? Maybe if I was going on a hike or... By the way, I got a new toy. And it blows bubbles. And it lights up in the dark. It's kind of like a flashlight. 
It is kind of like yeah, a flashlight. And it has when it blows out bubbles. Uh huh. Wow. Okay. Can we talk about your bubbles later? <laughs> you have a flashlight at your house? Well, would it make sense if I were going through a dark cave and I had the flashlight pointed this way? If I had it pointed at me? No, that wouldn't make any sense because I couldn't shine the light in front of me, right? Oh, you wouldn't be scared. Right, so I wouldn't be scared. Well, do you all remember talking about John the Baptist? Do you remember us talking about him? That's my daddy. That's your that's <laughs> <laughs> Well, John the Baptist was born just before Jesus was born. And there were people who thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah. I know Preston is crazy. But John's job was actually to shine his light on other people and prepare the way for Jesus because he was shining God's light before he even came to earth. And he didn't shine the light on himself and get his own glory. He gave that glory to God by shining the light on other people. So that's what we have to remember is that even if we're not always walking around with a flashlight shining at other people, our lives should be shining God's light everywhere that we go rather than shining it on ourselves. It, do, it does look bright as hell. <laughs> we'll see. You're absolutely right. Can we pray, guys? Okay. Good morning, Lord. It's us again. <laughs> we thank you that we're able to shine our light on those around us and be a reflection of your glory. Amen. All right. I have a feeling they're going to have a lot of fun in children's program today, <laughs> talking about lights and bubbles and all kinds of things. Let us pray. God of peace and possibility, we turn to your word to hear your will and your wisdom for our times. Open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit so that we might hear what you are saying to your people through Christ our Prince of Peace. Amen. Several Sundays ago, when we were doing a mic check in here, my microphone was turned up a tad too loud. So I jokingly said, well, we need to keep it that loud the next time I preach a sermon on hellfire and brimstone. And at that time, Ken was lighting the candles on the table, and he turned and said, well, sometimes we need one of those kind of sermons. Thankfully today, I will not be doing one of those sermons. <laughs> but John the baptizer is. This is from Matthew 3, the first 12 verses. Hear now the word of the Lord. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair, and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food were locust and wild honey. Then they went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region about the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit that befits 
repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When blossom flood amid the snow upon a winter's night was born the child of Christmas rose, the king of love and light. The angels sang, the shepherds sang, the grateful earth rejoice. And at his blessed birth, the source, the exaltation voice. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. glows to greet the holy night that gave the world its Christmas rose, its king of love and light. Let every voice exclaim his name, the grateful chorus well. From paradise to earth he came that we with him might dwell. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Did any of you notice in our scripture this morning that the good religious folks didn't show up to listen to what John had to say until after everybody else was following John? They didn't show up until John's message began to threaten their authority. They weren't there to repent or to denounce the ways that they were leading God's people astray, to humble themselves to this new thing that God was doing to bring his flock, his beloved flock, back home. No, they didn't show up for that reason. They showed up to make the people think that they're here for the party as well. They're ready to listen as well. We're all in this together. But John says it clearly, doesn't he? You brood of vipers. You do not bear fruit for God, but for yourselves. The axe is right, lying right there at the root of your tree. Do you not perceive that the mighty one, the Messiah, is coming? Prepare the way of the Lord or prepare for unquenchable fire. Most of you know that I do not do social media. But earlier in November, I found myself on the next door site because I wanted to post some pictures of some puppies that my friend Jill was trying to find a forever home for. And after I had posted those pictures of puppies, I began scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Now, I'm not sure what I was looking for, but it sure did find me. It was a wonderful post by my neighbor, Linda, who is a wonderful older Christian lady. She had posted that day a poem that included something that she says that we ought to consider. It was an updated version of a poem written by a German Lutheran minister during Nazi Germany. And because of the words that he wrote in that poem, he endured seven years in a Nazi concentration camp. The gist of Nye Muller's poem is that when they come for the others, he did nothing because he did not consider himself to be one of the others. He wasn't a socialist or a communist. He wasn't a Catholic or a Jew. He wasn't a gypsy immigrant or mentally disabled. And because he was none of those things when they came for them, he remained silent. But the last line of his poem is, Then they came for me, but there was no one left to speak for me. The very first comment under that beautiful poem was from neighbor Shireen. She wrote, Please define who the they are and give specific examples. Oh, that trap just laid right open for me and I stepped right in it. Because I'm a justice person. And I wasn't going to let that Shireen reduce this beautiful poem into political squalor. So I responded, Shireen, I think that they would be anyone who holds power or authority over anyone else. And the others? Well, the others are what Jesus would describe as the least of these. 
the hungry, the poor and thirsty, the oppressed, the ostracized, the lonely, and even the imprisoned. Then, as requested, I gave her specific examples. Here are some of my examples. The shootings of nine African-American parishioners as they gathered at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, for Bible study. The others. The 11 Jews who were gathered at the Tree of Life Synagogue for worshiping God. The others. The 23 Hispanics who were doing their back-to-school shopping at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. The others. Nine killed, 11 killed, 23 killed. The others. And rather than speaking up to the ills of our society that maybe makes these things happen, we turn it into a political debate. It's, it's not. And I'm not talking about a gun debate here either, so tamper it down. I'm talking about the fact that it's they versus we and not us. I ended my post there. And within a second, another person responded, Lisa, I'm not a religious person, but you are spot on. And I responded back, Barbara, Jesus wasn't much of a religious person either. When some began to question the validity of the poem and its historical reference, Debbie Moore Black, the woman that the Reverend Bill Neely knighted as our social conscience at Clover Presbyterian Church, Debbie actually posted the original poem with its historical and religious context. I was amazed that so many people started commenting about how we Christians need to do more for all the least of these, that we need to live up to Christ's call to love our neighbors, and yes, dear ones, our enemies. We were reminded that we aren't called to like or even agree with them, are we? No. Just love them. Treat them with the respect and dignity that we ourselves would like to be treated. And so many of our neighbors on next door were liking and loving and giving the thumbs up to all of these comments. Let's do better, one rallied. Another wrote, if Pastor Nymoller had the courage to stand up to tyranny and stand, or against tyranny, but stand up for the others, shouldn't we be willing to at least speak truth to power? Speak our truth the truth of Jesus Christ and what he taught his followers to say and to do? We should follow our rabbi, Jesus Christ, so closely that we walk in his dust. We had such a good thread going until neighbor John spoiled it all. You brood of vipers. Well, he didn't exactly write that, but that was his sentiment. He called us Christians hypocrites. He said that we don't really do for the others for them. We pick who the others are and do for them because it makes us feel good. We do for the others for ourselves. He said, we really don't step out on a limb, but we will go just as far as we feel uncomfortable. And then, hmm, the second we find ourselves being persecuted for standing up for those least of these, as soon as we find ourselves being persecuted, 
Oh, John had something to say about that. When you find yourselves too far out on your comfort limb, when your own lives begin to bend to the pressure he preached, how quickly you all go clinging back to your tree. Well, dear ones, that made me mad. But not because he was wrong. Before I could consider his comment objectively, I realized that I had to lay my defenses down. I had to try to understand before trying to be understood. I thought of John the baptizer and what warnings he had for the religious leaders of his day. Had they not become comfortable in their own lives? Complacent toward the needs of God's people? Compliant to the rule of Rome? Could John the neighbor possibly be prophetically speaking for John the baptizer, but this time to the Christians today? I had to wonder just how far we are willing to go out on that limb to reach out for the least of these, those that Jesus tells us to love, those that we are to treat as we would like to be treated, those who are different from us in color, creed, country, circumstances, you name it. Jesus didn't tell us we could pick the others. He didn't say we could decide, oh, these least of these are worthy of our love and respect. And these, well, that's just chafe for the unquenchable fire. Have we stopped going out on the limb when the comfort of our own lives are threatened? If so, I'm afraid that we've forgotten where the fruit of the good tree is found. Where's the fruit of the tree found? At the end of the limb. We got to go out to the end of the limb to get the good fruit, to be that good fruit. If we don't start focusing on that good fruit that Jesus Christ calls his followers to be, if we don't start focusing on that, we might have to turn our attention to the axe that is lying at the root of our tree. Heavenly Father, thy kingdom cares. But do we? Will there be anyone left to speak for us when we find ourselves counted as among the others? Yes, there is one who is coming, mightier than any of us. One whose sandals we are not worthy to carry. But Lord, give us the strength to follow those sacred sandals as far out on any limb that he leads us. Amen. I also recognized when I was debating back and forth that if I'm not careful, I become one of the they and treat the others as one of the others. So I invited neighbor Shireen for us to enjoy a cup of coffee together so we could talk. I could hear what she had to say to find out why she had her position and perhaps after I understood that, she'd be willing to listen to why I had the position I had. Because there's no us and they in God's people. There's just us. She did give me the little heart that she would like to have that cup of coffee. But she hasn't invited me out to have coffee yet. But she did say later she appreciated that we shared the same faith. The faith in Jesus Christ. So let us now stand... 
and express together what that faith is using the words of a declaration of faith that is printed in your bulletin. Please stand. God sent the promise delivered to his people. Jesus, the long-expected Savior, came into the world as a child, descended from David, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Mary, a virgin. He lived as a Jew among Jews. He announced to his people the coming of God's kingdom of justice and peace on earth. We affirm that Jesus was born of woman as is every child, yet born of God's power as was no other child. In the person and work of Jesus, God himself and a human life are united but not confused, distinguished but not separated. The coming of Jesus was itself the coming of God's promised rule through his birth, Life, death, and resurrection, he brings about the relationship between God and humanity that God always intended. Amen.
You may be seated. I do, of course, have concerns and celebrations to share with you this morning. Um, the first, Betty Love has tendonitis in her ankle, and it has a lovely boot that she gets to wear around. And she says she has some good days and bad days, but want to remember her in our prayers. And Peggy also continues to have good and bad days. Remember her as well. Um, Mike Doolin, we want to keep him in our prayers. He did get moved from one room to the other, and according to Mac Jr., he's doing better, but it's slowly but surely. So want to keep Mike in our prayers. Um, also, Marty Thomas, whom we've been praying for, had surgery to amputate a part of his leg last week. And um, although he got through the surgery rail, they've been trying to get him off the ventilator and there just doesn't seem to be the progress that the doctors were really hoping for at this point. So I want to keep Marty and his wife, Michelle, in our prayers. And our own Max Russell is having surgery on his shoulder this Tuesday. And then it's like tendons are completely separated from the um, bone. And of course, then he'll have his physical therapy. So we can keep him in our prayers, but as far away from us as possible. Because I understand physical therapy can make even good people <laughs> say some ugly things. Our celebrations today, uh, Debbie let me know that her friend um, April Miller, they had removed her lymph nodes and all came back clear. So the chemotherapy worked. So that was a huge, huge blessing. And also we have Jonathan Love's uh, birthday this week. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. God of the peaceable kingdom Isaiah envisioned, where predator and prey are reconciled and children play in safety, we give you thanks for every step taken toward reconciliation among rivals. We give you thanks for all who work toward providing all families and children and people a safe and reliable future. Thank you for those who toil on behalf of your creation to give us all hope for an enduring future in the world you love. For peace will not calm if the world keeps tilting out of balance. God of John the Baptist's rallying cry, you raised up John in the wilderness as a voice calling us to conversion. We thank you for signs of renewal and change in the church and in communities grappling with injustice, oppression, and disparity. God, advocates who work in your name for change with both courage and compassion. And as we await the coming of Christ, awaken this church to new ways to undertake ministry and mission and give us the energy and resources to reach out in ways we have yet to imagine. God of steadfast encouragement, St. Paul called the followers of Christ to live in harmony and welcome those perceived as strangers to you and to them. Thank you for welcoming us when we were strangers to a new community, a new church, or a life changed by unexpected circumstance. We pray for the people who dread this Christmas season because life has changed for them or circumstances leave them feeling lonely and discouraged. Draw close to those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit and guide us to reach out to someone, anyone, who needs comfort or encouragement. God of justice and equity, the Psalms, the prophets, and the Gospels proclaim your care for the poor and your expectation that your people will look to the needs of the vulnerable, indeed the least of these among us. We pray for places torn apart by war and for communities devastated by storm, flood, fire, or drought. Challenge any who would hoard scarce resources or profit from the needs of others, and open our hearts to share what we can, even in these difficult times. God of peace and promise, receive the tithes and gifts as seeds of gratitude for your gift to us in Christ Jesus. Bless these seeds with growth, 
so that the peace of your kingdom can be found here on earth as it is in heaven. Hear our prayers, O God, and strengthen us to serve you in faith and obedience. For we offer our prayers through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. this day, ready to bear fruit, worthy of your commitment to Jesus Christ and his kingdom of justice and peace. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.